Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to our African American reading here at West Avenue School. We are doing this in conjunction with Rowan University since we are a, a professional development school. And the African American reading is something that goes on throughout the country during um, February and Black History Month. This, is, this was started in 1990 by the Black Caucus of the NCTE, which is the National Council of Teachers of English. So it's something that's very important that goes on, and it celebrates the written word of African Americans. So the whole premise today is to listen to um, some might be poetry, some might be a book, some could be uh, a speech, but it's written by an African American writer. Also on the screen, you're going to see just a, I just did a few of some of the people that I enjoy as writers, and there's some, um, a little bit of information about uh, these people. And so hopefully you're going to learn a little bit more. You may be interested in finding out about these people and their writings. So what we're going to do today is this. Readers will come up. They will introduce themselves and they will introduce the piece that they're writing and who has written it. And um, also, I just like you to listen carefully to some of the things that are said because some of the writers that we have here today or that they're presenting are people that you may never have heard of and may want to further research. Some people are, are others that might, you, you may already know, like Martin Luther King. And so what we'd like to do right now is I'd like to introduce Dr. Gilson, our superintendent. He's going to come up first, and he'll be talking. Um, I think he's reading a speech today. So I'd like everyone, on their best behavior, of course, your West Avenue School students, and to listen carefully to what is said. So without any further ado, we have Dr. Gilson here. indicated I am reading a speech by someone we all know, Dr. Martin Luther King. And as I reviewed this speech, it struck me that as a graduate of Brixton High School and a, a kid who went to school not far from here in the little town of Cedarville, I almost feel like this was a, a speech written about me. So I hope that you feel the same way. Whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as a pattern, as the guide. And a building is not well erected without a good blueprint. Now each of you is constructing a blueprint of your life as you sit here today. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. I want to suggest some of the things that should begin your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity. I will digress for a minute. If you call the Bridgeton Public Schools, you will get a recording. And what the recording says is your dignity is important. No one should ever take away your dignity. Don't allow anyone to make you feel that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have a basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days, as the years unfold what you will do with your life what your life's work will be. Set out to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to you. Doors of opportunity that were not always available to your mothers, to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to face these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, wrote, 
If a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. As long as you do it well, people will find you. This hasn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. So I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. I understand all the sociological reasons for dropping out of school, but I urge you that in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you're forced to live in, stay in school. And when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls, your lot, falls on your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Martin Luther King Jr.
what can you do to help the homeless in our community? Perhaps we can make sandwiches also. So they send me over 200 sandwiches every Friday. Every Friday, somebody drives up to my office, brings a box, about four boxes full of sandwiches so I can give out to everybody. And so the question I want to ask you, what can you do to help me out? I would love for people here in the city of Bridgeton to know that the sandwiches came from West Avenue School. So I want you to put your thinking caps on and think, what can you do? Perhaps you can make sandwiches too. Everybody here likes peanut butter and jelly, right? Somebody said no. You don't like peanut butter and jelly? All right. I like peanut butter and jelly. So perhaps what you could do, and Dr. Hall, I'll be happy to find it, pay for the bread and the peanut butter and jelly out of my own pocket if your school would love to do something like that. Or maybe you can think of something else, another idea. But like Martin Luther King said, the most important question is what are you doing for the other people? How are you making their lives better? One thing I try to do, in my front of my house, I have a little library in which I put books in there for anybody to come take, read, or put books in. You know what? I got a student from West Avenue who stops by my house every morning and looks in there for books. Who's that person? Aww. Set up, set up. Tell somebody your name. <laughs> Ryan. She stops by Dr. Hall every morning. And I, the last couple of weeks, I messed up. I haven't put any new books in there. <laughs> but I tell you what, when you get home from school today, there are going to be whole different books in that library. That's one way I, I, I wanted to help and make my community better. And so I got books, children's books, all type of magazines. Sometimes I put crayons and other things in there so that I can get a free book or put a book in there that she's done. That's my way of trying to help my community. How am I making my community a better community? So I want you. Go back to your class and think about what can you do to help your, the city of Britain to become great. I like to say we're great because I got great students, great teachers, great administrators here in the city of Britain. And that's why I said, I tell everybody, one time I was at the White House, they wanted me to introduce myself. And I stood up and said, I'm the mayor of the great city of Britain. They probably say, is he crazy? <laughs> I never heard of the great city of Bridgeton. But I believe that because of you, and what are you going to do to help me out, I know that I'm going to continue to say I'm the mayor of the great city of Bridgeton. I enjoy being the mayor of Bridgeton. I get a chance to meet people like you and, and see teachers and interact with people who want to make our city great. Yes. Did I say Donald Trump? No, that was before Donald Trump was uh, elected. I've been to the White House four times, but I haven't had an invitation. Some of, my, some of the other mayors I know have been there, but I haven't been there. All right? Any questions, anybody? Now, let me ask you this last question. Are you going to help me make Richmond a great city? Yes. Are you going to go back and think of an idea that you can help contribute so that we can help people in our city? Yes, sir. Yes. Right, yes, those sound, does it sound like it? Sure, yes. Yeah. Let me hear that. Yeah. 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 Dr. Hall, when 
your students, if and when your students do something that we're going to contribute, I'm going to come back, I'm going to do something for your students. Okay. All right? Good. That's my promise to you. If you promise to me that you're going to make Bridgeton a better place to live. Thank you very much.
I never uh, public spoke before, so I got embarrassed and I uh, fainted. So uh, you know, they took me to the nurse's office. They took me home. So my parents uh, got me an autobiography of Dr. J, and they told me uh, how well he spoke and how well dressed he was. I mean, we all knew he was a great basketball player. But what inspired me was how articulate he was. And uh, so with his inspiration, I ended up uh, being in charge of my class reunions. Uh, I'm the president of the uh, downtown Vineland. And uh, both my parents uh, died from cancer. So from 2008 to 2017, I donated uh, 100 shoes uh, to the needy. But in 2018, uh, my friends found out about it, and uh, I had uh, 80 friends give me money, and we donated a uh, thousand shoes and a thousand socks to the needy. In uh, 2019, we donated uh, 3,000 shoes, 3,000 socks, 3,000 laces. Uh, CBS Philadelphia uh, came to my store and did a special on it, and. Uh, so you can go from the person that has anxiety and nervous to speak in public to you can be in charge of your class reunion, chairman of the downtown, president of Al Shoes, and uh, I think next year it's, I already had someone tell me they're going to give me 40 uh, bags of clothes to go along with the thousands of shoes, socks, and laces. So if you ever feel like you know, you're down and out or you're nervous, but you know, Dr. J inspired me because how well he spoke. If you ever want to Google Dr. J, he wasn't just a great basketball player. He was uh, a well-dressed, well-spoken man who inspired me. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. My name is Erica Mosley, and I grew up here in Bridgeton. I actually grew up in Amity Heights. I went to Cherry Street, and then I went to the middle school in Bridgeton High School. And I want to talk to you guys today. It's Black History Month. We always go through, you know, all of the prominent Black history uh, historians. You know, Harriet Tubman, Tubman, Rosa Parks. But today I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit. I do have a book, but you guys are older, so we're going to interact a little bit, okay? I want to talk to you guys about HBCU. If I raise a hand, how many people have heard of HBCU? All right. Anybody want to tell me what it stands for? Back there. Dang, did anybody, everybody hear that? Historically black colleges and universities. Anyone know how, why it was established? Historically black colleges and universities? Okay, that's what I'm gonna come in, because nobody else raised their hand, okay? So historically black colleges and universities, I'm gonna take this down, Alex, put it too high. Um, they were established before the Civil Rights Movement. And the reason they were established was because education, educating black people were illegal. And you guys, did you know education for blacks were, was illegal back in the day? Yes. yes, okay. So education was illegal. So once Pennsylvania abolished slavery, there was a small farm in Cheney, Pennsylvania that opened up the farm for blacks that had either escaped slavery or were free to start learning elementary and secondary education. So it started out teaching them how to read from the beginning because it was illegal for them to learn. That campus then turned into a college that started to educate the African-American adults 
so that they could attain degrees. But that wasn't the first college to give a degree. Does anyone know the first college or university to actually give out degrees? It was in Philadelphia. Yes. What, what? No, it was Lincoln University. Lincoln University was the first college to give out degrees. So when Pennsylvania abolished slavery, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, abolished slavery in 1777, I believe it was. Fact check me, Google. I know y'all all know how to use Google or ask Alexa. Um, so yeah, so yeah. So I'm gonna go, I, I'm gonna go back, all right? So it was established because blacks were illegally denied education and the first institute was in Pennsylvania in 1837. Okay. You may think that historically black colleges are only for black people. It started out that way, but right now it's a very diverse population. 70% are black, 13% are white, 15% are Hispanic, and 2% are other. Asian, uh, Polynesian, they're just a different race. So it was established for African Americans, but now it's open to everyone else. So I wanted to give you that history first before I read the book. And I do have someone here that's gonna to talk to you about all of the opportunities that you have at a black university. Okay, so the book is called My HBCU Life. And it's not a real university. Let me go back. I went to Delaware State University in Delaware. This book is based on that university as well as Clark Atlanta University and the author is an African-American author who is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So the book is called, again, by HBCU Light. Around this time every October, Angel's parents get excited. They look at old pictures, talk about historically black colleges and universities. HBCUs and share memories of their former school. P.U. is how you say that, which is Panther University. I love my HBCU, shouted Angel's mother. Angel and her cousin DJ, who was staying over for the weekend, woke up because of the noise. They ran downstairs quickly to see what was going on. We have a surprise for you. For you, yes. For us, yes. Get ready and experience the HBCU homecoming, said Angel's dad. Angel and DJ jumped up and down with excitement before running upstairs to change into their new shirts. They had collected many items and they always displayed HBCU love wherever they went. Panther University is in Atlanta, Georgia with several successful black entrepreneurs, civil rights leaders, and celebrities. Some of them are Oprah Winfrey, who attended a HBCU, Thurgood Marshall attended an HBCU. Nikki Giovanni also attended an HBCU. And Spike Lee, just to name a few. HBCUs were created for African Americans when we weren't allowed to attend other schools, said Angel's mom. She talked about the significance of the legal case Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Angel, her mom, her dad, and DJ made it to campus. They saw Peter the Panther. There's always a big display of HBCU pride at homecoming. They call it Panther Pride. Pete, you, you know, they, the crowd cheered. Angel and DJ love to read and they are excited to see the school library. HBCU students spend a lot of time in the library studying. This is where I met your mom said Dad. Across the street was a beautiful historic statue. It was W.E.B. Du, e. du Bois, a scholar, author, and school a social engineer. He was a professor of economics and history at the Atlanta University Center for 23 years. They traveled around campus. It had the most beautiful decorations hanging from pole to pole. There, the red, white, and black balloons there were red, white, and black balloons, beautiful banners, and people everywhere. It is a milestone anniversary at the campus. 
It's filled with HBCU pride. Black Excellence Streets, Black Excellence Streets is where everyone gathered for parade and Mr. and Mrs. BHU, HBCU arrived on their beautiful float. They wave at Angel and DJ. When we grow up, we can be queens and kings, said Angel. HBCU use are awesome, said DJ. When the parade ended, they walked inside the student center to get to the bookstore. DJ found the best children's books in the entire world, said Angel. It has a black panther on it, and it is titled My HBCU Life. They passed several students and saw members of black Greek sororities and fraternities. There is a special sisterhood and brotherhood amongst them, explained Angel's mom. The support of our community through education, economics, culture, service, activities, and more. Angel and her mom and dad and DJ finally made it to the stadium. The halftime show had just started. I see the famous Panther University marching band, said Angel. The Essence dance team also performs in the, with the band. They have beautiful outfits and are always in, in rhythm for the drums. The football team is ready to win. Let's go, Panthers. Everyone in the stadium shouted as the team rushed into the field. Angel and DJ had a long day and are now ready to eat. Angel's parents took them to the tailgate area for the food. People all old and new were dancing, eating, and singing. One thing that I can share with you guys about a D, uh, um, HBCU is that there are a lot to do. There are a lot of things to do there, and it is a uh, institute that educates you, it's very diverse, and you can get scholarships. So uh, I'm going to have Carol Green come up and she's going to talk about some of the opportunities that you guys have. She takes a college tour every year, so um, she goes on a regular basis and she knows exactly what um, there is to do on an HBCU camp. So Carol Green. Because you have a supporting cast 
and you're going to end up not having a big bill when you get out of high school, I mean out of college. The other thing is that you got kids that look just like you. When I, you know, when I talk to students that go on our uh, annual college tour, Gateway sponsors their annual college tour, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the one thing I also say to the students is that you're going to school to, uh, where kids look just like you which tells you if they can do it, you can do it. We have kids that go to HBCUs that are from California, because most of the HBCUs are on this side of the country. Okay, you have kids from California that's going to school in Pennsylvania, Maryland, DC, North Carolina, and they look just like you. So if they took the time out to do their work, do the research, end up over here on this side of the country, you can do the same thing, and they look just like you. You know, this, uh, this Erica told you what the percentage is? Yeah, right? And therefore, they were set up for African Americans, but you have a diverse population, which we have a diverse population here that attend. So if they can do it, you can do it. Also, in the HBCU, you actually get a, a chance to meet other kids and other students. Students that have some of the same issues that you may have. Students that, you know, have the same interests that you have. So you get that opportunity to meet them and to learn from them. You teach them a few things, they teach you a few things. So the, the whole concept of attending an HBCU, and a lot of times what happens is that, you know, they have football teams. So anybody wants to play on a football team, they have basketball teams, they have baseball teams, they have soccer teams, they have a big band, the big band is a big thing, okay? So they have all the activities that any other, which we call the PWI, may have, <laughs> that have. So they have that. And a lot of times, I don't know if anybody ever talk, heard their big brother or big sister talk about D1, D1 or what they call top-notch schools. Whereas they end up on TV, a lot of their football players and a lot of their basketball players end up going to professional sports. HBCUs have deep ones as well. Okay, so always remember that. And if you're good, whether you go to a D1 or a D2, they'll find you. So we don't have to worry about that part. So just that whole concept of, you know, I, I want to go to a D1, I don't want to go to a D2, listen. You're good, they're going to find you. D1s are HBCUs as well. Now, just now being exposed to an HBCU, <coughs> what we do at Gateway, every year during spring break, we sponsor a tour. And we visit eight to nine HBCUs during the spring break. We take a busload of students, Students that have an interest in attending, and even if they don't have an interest in attending an HBCU, one thing it does is it gets them away from the neighborhood, and it gives them the exposure and the opportunity to, again, to see other kids that do the same thing that you're doing. And we visit different schools. Now, this year, Ms. Erica talked about Cheney. We're going to visit Cheney. She talked about Lincoln. We're going to visit Lincoln, because Cheney's here and Lincoln's here. So we're going to visit those two schools. Then we're going to move down and go into my alma mater, Morgan State University. Every year we go there, okay? In the summertime, we always take students about your age to Morgan State University, okay? So, we, so we'll be moving down to visit Morgan, Howard, uh, North Carolina A&T, Clark Atlanta, who the person that wrote that book is from Clark Atlanta, and we're going to Tuskegee Institute. Anybody ever heard of the Tuskegee Airmen? Okay, we're going there in Atlanta, in um, you know, Alabama State University. Now, we try to visit different schools. One more other school, Fort Valley. Fort Valley is a new school. It's been around, but every year we try to see a different school that's new and then double back to see some of the old, uh, old schools. But remember this. That opportunity comes up, someone tells you, let's go visit the HBCU, take that opportunity. And when you get into 10th grade, you think about it, the Gateway's going to do this. I, that's how I got to an HBCU. I went on a college tour with Gateway, and they took me to Morgan State University and some other schools. 
When that opportunity come about, take advantage of it. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maurice Tindell. I'm the Director of Human Resources here for the District, and I'm going to be reading two poems for you this morning by Claude McCain. The first one is entitled Poetry. Sometimes I tremble like a storm-swept flower and seek to hide my tortured soul from thee, bowing my head in deep humility. Before the silent thunder of thy power, sometimes I flee before the blazing light. As from the specter of pursuing death, intimidating less thy mighty breath, windward ways we sweep me into utter night. For oh, I fear that will be swallowed up. The loves which are to me are vital worth, my passion and my pleasure in the earth. And lost forever in thy magic cup, I fear, I fear my truly human heart will perish on the altar stone of art. That was the first one. <laughs> Next we have a poem called the Prayer. Mid the discordant noise of the day, I hear thy calling. I stumble as I fare along earth's way. Keep me from falling. My eyes are open, but they cannot see for gloom of night. I can no more lift my heart to be for inward light. The wild and fury passion of my youth consumes my soul. In agony I turn to thee, the truth and self-control. For passion and all its pleasures it can give will die with death. But this of me eternally must live, thy borrowed death. May the, may the discordant noise of the day, I hear thy calling. I stumble as I fare along earth's way. Keep me from falling. Claude McKay was born in Jamaica in 1889, and he wrote about social and political concerns from a perspective of a black man in the United States. So those are two poems today by Claude McKay. there's still farmland there. 
and Shimon is just a little ways up the highway, not far, in New Jersey. But William still wrote a book called The Underground Railroad. And as I reread last night, you could open up to any page and begin to read some of the accounts of those slaves with whom he helped. How many have heard of Harriet Tubman? Most of you. Harriet, early on, made her way to Philadelphia. And in making her way to Philadelphia, she came across a man named William Still. And I just want to read uh, one of the letters because the Underground Railroad book that William Still wrote is a compilation of the letters that he received or that he wrote about, excuse me. And he said it was fresh from the lips of those slaves that he ultimately helped to get to other places. Some going towards Canada, some going to North Jersey, and even some who lived right here in our area. In the language of the poet, stop, poor sinner, stop and think. Before you go further, Think about the brink of death, of everlasting woe. Say, have you an arm like God that you will, that you his will oppose? Fear you not that iron rod with which he breaks his foes. This was written by Edmund Turner, who wrote to William Still, saying, a favorable opportunity affords the pleasure of acknowledging the receipts and letters and papers. Certainly in this region, they were highly appreciated. And I hope the time may come that your kindness will be reciprocated. We are all well at present, but the times continue to be dull. I also deeply regret the excitement recently on account, on the account of those slaves. You will favor me by keeping me posted upon the subject. Those words written to the slaveholder is the thought of one who had suffered. And now I thought it is duly incumbent upon me to cry aloud and spare not by sending these few lines where the slaveholder may hear. You will still further oblige your humble servant also to correct any inaccuracy. My respects to you and your family and all inquiring friends your friend and well-wisher, Edmund Turner. Something I learned as I grew older, and I love history, English is probably my favorite subject, but I love history, I love learning about different things, and as a little girl, my grandparents taught us about our family history. I learned that William Still, while living in Philadelphia, not only was he an underground railroad agent who helped slaves escape, and he kept the records, and it is documented, that these relatives would be able to find their family members later on. I learned that he was a wealthy coal merchant, which I had no idea about that. I also learned that Still also helped to found the first Black YMCA. Anybody go to the Y? Anybody work out at the Y? As you learn from many of uh, the people here, some who have written poems, some of the, who have read someone else's poems, I've been writing since I was about seven years old. And for me, being a still is probably one of my proudest moments because. Every year, for 150 years, we celebrated the annual Stills Day in Longside, New Jersey. We started out with three. One in Mount Laurel in July, one in August in Longside, and we also do an annual Stills Day in Vineland, New Jersey. We are doing 149 years. Longside has done the 150 because that's where it began. So in writing, I wrote Heritage. The Stills are descendants of royalty, a blessing of God, a loving family. Having suffered through hardships and many shed tears, they've learned of their heritage and value down through the years. 
with little focuses on losses and little on lack. The stills have learned to look forward and not to look back. So keep pressing on, still family, and be all God has commissioned you to be. For your strength, your honor, and your dignity are truly a blessing for others to see. Thank you. Of the West Avenue School family 
I'm very honored and proud to have provided support to your principal, Mr. Hall, and this year working with Mrs. Houston. So it's a pleasure to be here. I will be sharing with you an excerpt from the book by Dr. Martin Luther King called The Measure of a Man. And before I begin, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be hearing some of the same messages and words that Dr. Gilson said to you earlier. I had no idea what he was going to be leading to you, and I'm not going to apologize for the repetition because the message that you'll hear again is how I based my life on in my career in order to be the best I could be. There are three dimensions of any complete life to which we can fitly give the words of the text length, breadth, and height. The length of life, as we shall think of it here, is not its duration or its longevity, but is, it is the push of a life forward to achieve its personal ends and ambitions. It is the inward concern for one's own welfare. The breadth of life is the outward concern for the welfare of others. The height of life is the upward reach for God. These are the three dimensions of life. And without the three being correlated, working harmoniously together, life is incomplete. At one angle stands the individual person. At the other angle stand other persons. And at the top stands the supreme, infinite person, God. These three must meet in every individual life if that life is to be complete. Now let us notice first the length of life. I have said that this is the dimension of life in which the individual is concerned with developing his inner powers. It is that dimension of life in which the individual pursues personal ends and ambitions. This is perhaps the selfish dimension of life and there is such a thing as moral and rational self-interest. If one is not concerned about himself, he cannot be totally concerned about others. Some years ago, a learned rabbi, the late Joshua Liebman, wrote a book entitled, Peace of Mind. He has a chapter in the book entitled, Love Thyself Properly. In this chapter, he says in substance that it is impossible to love other selves adequately unless you love your own self properly. Many people have been plunged into the abyss of emotional fatalism because they did not love themselves properly. So every individual has a responsibility to be concerned about himself enough to discover what he is made for. After he discovers his calling, he should set out to do it with all of the strength and power in his being. He should do it as if God Almighty called him at this particular moment in history to do, do it. He should seek to do his job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn child not do it better. No matter how small one thinks his life work is in terms of the norms of the world and the so-called big jobs, he must realize that it, is, that it has cosmic significance he is serving humanity and doing the will of God. To carry this to one extreme, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweet streets as Raphael painted pictures, sweet streets as Michelangelo carved marble, sweet streets as Beethoven composed music, sweet streets as Shakespeare wrote poetry, sweet streets so well that all the hosts of heavens and on earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. In the words of Douglas Mallet, if you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. When you do this, you have mastered the first dimension of life, the length of life. But don't stop here. It is dangerous to stop here. There are some people who never get beyond the first dimension. They are brilliant people. 
Often they do an excellent job in developing their inner powers, but they live as if nobody else lived in the world but themselves. There is nothing more tragic than to find an individual bogged down in the length of life, the void of breath. The breath of life is that dimension of life in which we are concerned about others. An individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Thank you. Dr. Celeste Merriweather. I am the director. Ooh, that's my old job. I know. Come on now. I am the assistant superintendent of the Richmond Public School. I will be reading the story Amazing Grace. And it's written by Mary Hoffman. girl who loved stories. She didn't mind if they were read to her or told to her or made up in her own head. She didn't care if they were books and movies or out of Nana's long memories. Grace just loved stories. After she had heard them, and sometimes while they were still going on, Grace would act them out, and she always gave herself the most exciting part. Grace went on into battle as Joan of Arc and wove a wicked web as a Nazi, the spider. She hid inside the wooden horse at the gates of Troy. She went exploring from lost kingdoms, and she sailed the seven seas with a peg leg and a parrot. She was Hiawatha sitting in the shining big sea water and Mowgli in the backyard jungle. Most of all, Grace loved to act out adventure stories and fairy tales. When there was no one else around, Grace played all the parts herself. She set out to seek her fortune with no companion but her trusty cat and found a city with streets paved in gold. Or she was Aladdin, rubbing his magic lamp to make the genie appear. Sometimes she could get so busy, excuse me, sometimes she could get Ma and Nana to join in when they weren't too busy. Then she was Dr. Grace and their lives were in her hands. One day Grace's teacher said that they would do the play Peter Pan. Grace knew who she wanted to be. When she raised her hand, Rod said, you can't be Peter. That's a boy's name. But Grace, kept, but Grace kept her hand up. You can't be Peter Pan, whispered Natalie. He isn't black. But Grace kept her hand up. All right, said the teacher. Lots of you want to be Peter Pan, so we'll have auditions next week to choose parts. She then gave them words to learn. When Grace got home, she seemed sad. What's the matter, said Mom. Raj said, I can't be Peter Pan because I'm a girl. That just shows what Raj knows, said Mom. A girl can be Peter Pan if she wants to. Grace cheered up. Then she remembered something else. Well, Natalie says, I can't be Peter Pan because I'm black. She said, Mom looked angry. But before she could speak, Nana said, it seems that Natalie is another one who don't know nothing. You can be anything you want, Grace, if you put your mind to it. On Saturday, Nana and Grace, Nana told Grace they were going out. In the afternoon, they caught a bus and train into town. Nana took Grace to a grand theater. The sign outside, outside read, Rosalie Wilkins in Romeo and Juliet in sparkling night lights. Are we going to the ballet, Nana? We are, honey, but first I want you to look at this picture. Grace looked up and saw a beautiful ballerina in a stunning tutu. Above the dancer, it said, New Juliet. That one is little Rosalie from back home in Trinidad, said Nana. Her granny and me, we grew up together on the island. She's always asking me, do I want, to see, do I want tickets to see her Rosalie dance? So this time, I said yes. 
After the ballet, Grace played the part of Juliet, dancing around the room in her imaginary tutu. I can be anything I want, she thought. On Monday, the class met for auditions to choose who was best for each part. When it was Grace's turn to be Peter, she knew exactly what to do and all the words to say. She had been Peter Pan all weekend. She took a deep breath and imagined herself flying. When it was time to vote, the class chose Raj to be Captain Hope and Natalie to be Wendy. There was no doubt who would be Peter Pan. Everyone voted for Grace. You are fantastic, whispered Natalie. The play was a big success, and Grace was an amazing Peter Pan. After it was all over, she said, I feel as if I could fly all the way home. You probably could, said Ma. Yes, said Nana. If Grace put her mind to it, she can do anything she wants. Thank you.
he is an activist, he is also an actor. So in order for me to connect that, I'm going to connect that to you in advance. And then I'm going to read the poem. And the poem is by a young lady named Kiana Davis. At your leisure, especially for my young ladies, my princesses, please look her up because you're going to be able to see yourself in her writing. And, and I connected with this poem because I was having a conversation with a staff member here. And that staff member told me that a young lady told her that she was tired of hearing about black history and black history. And she just happens to be African American. And it hurt me because we are more than Rosa Parks. We are more than Harriet Tubman, who, just for the record, actually visited and came through Cumberland County. And the place that she came through was actually called is a church that was part of the Underground Railroad in Cumberland County. That church is still open. So I encourage, I just see some, I saw some eyebrows going. I encourage the school system to actually make an appointment to take the students here to visit that place. The pews that are still there are the pews that Harriet Tubman sat on. The underground tunnel that was underneath of the pulpit is still there. A graveyard where slaves that died in the passage, where they're buried, that is still there. That is part of Cumberland County's history. So we are part of the history. We are part of this thing that we call America the Beautiful. So, Kiana's poem starts out like this. Yesterday in a writing circle, a young lady who does not know the history of her work shared a poem addressed to God, asking him why he made her black and gave her nappy hair of wool and why the color of her skin was rooted in all things evil. And I listened, pretending my heart wasn't breaking for her and for me, for all my brown girls who have spent their time wishing away traces of their blackness. Yesterday, my niece insisted we watch Beyonce's Lemonade twice. She cried. And I cried for the second time that day. And then Jesse Williams' speech brought me to my knees. I cried for the fire that keeps us going. I cried to be strong like those who came before me. I cried to lay my burdens down and be no ways tired. I cried as I stood up. That is by Kiana Davis. And the next one is anonymous. But for those of us who have a little bit of time behind us, you will find that this is very similar to my Angelus phenomenon. From the color of my skin to the texture of my hair, to the length of my strands, to the breadth of my smile, to the stride of my gait, to the span of my arms, to the depth of my bosom, to the curve of my hips, to the glow of my skin, my black. Is beautiful. I cannot be denied. I will not be contained. And only I will define it. For when I look in my mirror, my very soul cries out, mm, my black is beautiful. And so today, I speak it out loud, unabashedly. I declare it anew. My black is beautiful. Whether celebrated, imitated, exploited, or degenerated, whether natural from inside or skillfully applied, my black is beautiful. To my daughters, my sisters, my nieces, my cousins, my colleagues, and my friends, I speak for us all when I say, my black is beautiful. Now I will leave you with one of my own favorite endings whenever I do 
motivational speaking. And it goes like this. Is the me that you see the me that's really me? Or is the me that you see what you want me to be? So when you greet me, greet me blindly, as I will reach you. I will give you the key that unlocks our doability for me to be me and you to be you. Thank you. Thank you. 